Hey, welcome to another week of the Reformed and Charismatic podcast. Uh, we got a special guest today. Uh, we got Dr. Jared Moore, and we're going to be discussing his uh, book called The Lust of the Flesh. So I'm going to go ahead and add him to the stage here, and we can just get uh, going. All right. There we are. Hey. So uh, uh, why don't you just uh, introduce yourself, like maybe tell us what you do, uh, family life, um, yeah, and where sure. you're at. I am a pastor. I've been a pastor or served in pastoral ministry in the SBC for 23 years, um, married with four kids. My oldest is 16, uh, youngest is nine, and um I got a uh, PhD from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary um, in systematic theology in 2019, and I wrote my dissertation on concupiscence, which is just evil desire within us, and uh, I particularly focused on same-sex attraction. And so my book, The Lust of the Flesh, is a um, it's a laity version of my dissertation. Um, you know, we've uh, you know, 50s, 60s, and before, there was, people called it fire and brimstone preaching. And the pendulum has swung the other way because of pastors like Joel Osteen and, you know, even Billy Graham in his early days heavily emphasized repentance. You can go look up old clips of him. And, um, but the kind of the Joel Osteen effect has, a, has negatively impacted all of evangelicalism to where, we don't even know what sin is. You know, we don't know what we're saved from. And so we don't appreciate grace. We don't appreciate God's grace. We don't even really understand God's grace. And uh, and so I hope, you know, folks who've read my book that aren't, um, they don't battle same-sex desires, but they, um, they said it helped them just basically quit making excuses for sin and uh, to identify sin clearly. The only people who need to make excuses for their sin are those who are, um, don't have a savior who aren't trusting in Christ. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And um, wait, so where are you from again? You're in Tennessee, right? Yeah, yeah, Crossville, yeah. Tennessee. I, I okay. pastor Cumberland Homestead's Baptist Church. Okay. And uh, where's that at in Tennessee? Because I've only ever been to to Nashville. Really? Yeah. Yeah, Nashville's not a good reflection of what Tennessee <laughs> is, man. Um. It's probably the most liberal place in Tennessee. But, uh, I mean, I like Nashville, but you know what I'm saying? It's just not like the rural communities. So on I-40, you know, it, it stretches from the west coast to the east coast. But on I-40 from Nashville to Knoxville, right in the middle is Crossville. So Knoxville's in uh, probably the third or fourth uh, largest city in Tennessee. And that's uh, probably two hours uh, east of Nashville. So right in the middle is uh, Crossville. Okay, yeah. I have some friends um, from this area that just moved to Knoxville. Um, well, I think it's one of the um, outside, like the ones outside of it. Marysville, I think it is. Yeah, Maryville. Yeah, so, yeah, they just moved there probably like a year ago. Yeah. It's a nice place. Yeah, yeah. It, from what I've seen in the pictures and stuff, um like I said, I've only been in Nashville though. So yeah, I'm in California. Um, cool. but yeah, don't let that, uh, <laughs> scare you off too much. Um, I'm in the central Valley. I don't know if you know too much about California, but, um, we're in the more conservative area. Um, a lot of ag, a lot of farmers and stuff like that. So it's a big area of California, basically in between like the Bay area and Los Angeles. Okay. So, yeah. We've got some folks that just moved from California about six months ago. They bought a farm, and uh, they've been attending. Um, but uh, it's it's interesting talking with them because they're ba they basically flee fleed, you know, fled. And... Yeah. No, that was the same story with our friends. Um, but uh, God has not called us out of here yet. So, uh, sure. yeah, we're here. It's a big mission field, man. People... I don't know. They just think with their feelings, you know. They don't think logically, biblically. They think logically about money, but yeah, n not with, um, not with anything political. It seems it's just uh, 
Well, I mean, they're whether you're Democrat or Republican, there are Republicans that live on, you know, they're foolish as well. Uh, but anyways, yeah, want to get particularly political, but yeah, not for sure. Um, yeah, so uh, I read your book. Um, I think I finished it like late this last year, like December of 2023. Oh, cool. And a great book, by the way. Um, so one of the main themes in it, what you mentioned was concupiscence. And I had to like look up how to pronounce that. Sure. Um, but so I had never heard of this before. Um, I have a, you know, a bachelor's in biblical studies. Um, I've taken seminary classes. I've been in church since I was like 10 and I've never heard of concupiscence. So, um, you said you kind of summarized in the beginning, but it's a strong desire for sin. It's just an evil desire, any evil desire that's evil inclination, whatever you want to call it, fleshly desire, um, it's what's left over of original sin in Christians. And before you become a Christian, that's all you are. You're nothing but concupiscence. You're nothing but evil desire. I mean, even even the good things that people do that are unbelievers are for like pharisaical reasons, self-righteous reasons, or there there is no love outside of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, if you are rejecting God, rejecting Christ, you you're nothing but sin. And, devil doesn't care how you get to hell you know is if um you know if you get there through your good works or you get there through heinous sin he just he doesn't care you're reflecting him in both of those yeah and um i i so i what i liked about the book too is it really traces the this idea of concupiscence from like the early church fathers like augustine all the way through the reformers which you, I think you did a really good job on. Um, but where do you think that got lost along the way? Like, why did we forget about this? I think it was an overemphasis on grace, an overemphasis on God's love. And then with the, with the culture shifting and changing what love is, um, you know, it's not 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, um, where love doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing. Um, is is one of the aspects of love. Love is tolerance today, and so folks, that's what they think love is. Um, they think God tolerates us or loves us because we're lovely. Uh, there's no, there's very little preaching on sin. There's very little preaching on God's wrath. Um, people people don't know that they're children of wrath, and uh, pastors need to be preaching. If you're preaching 50% love, you need to be preaching 50% God's wrath. I mean, Revelation, the book of Revelation, is the most terrifying book in the Bible. And Jesus comes back as a lion, a lion destroying his enemies. And, um, I mean, it, you know, the angels call the birds to come feast on the flesh of all those who oppose him. And that's how he's coming back at the, as this victorious warrior who literally annihilates his enemies and sends the unrepentant to hell for all eternity i mean you know and folks uh, folks get hung up on the old testament like uh, andy stanley you know let's unhitch from the old testament it's got too much you know too much uh stuff we don't like in it but man the book of revelation is scarier than i mean if you're if you're talking about what's fair from a secular standpoint, the most unfair book in the Bible is Revelation. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I was like, kind of like, so I was thinking about this. So I think in maybe junior high or high school, we read through Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, Jonathan Edwards, you know, sermon. And it was really like painted as this like, you know, really horrible, um, fundamental, even though I don't know why that's like a bad word these days, uh, view of Christianity. But when mm -hmm. you now on this side of it, you're like, he's preaching sound doctrine, right? And I was sharing my testimony last night at our, our young adults group. And I think one of the graces that God actually gave me as a kid was a fear of hell. And there, I mean, again, I, I think I took it like really like, where anything I did was wrong, like it, got in a fight at school, I cussed someone out or something. I was like up at night, like praying and begging for forgiveness. 
And um, I said, I don't think this is a bad thing, though. Like, you know, I, I think this is a grace that God had given me as a kid. And you don't really hear preachers talk about that kind of stuff anymore. Um, even some of the charismatic circles that I, I kind of grew up in, they were like, you know, today's the day of salvation. You can walk out of this church building, cross the street, get hit by a bus. Like, do you know where you're going? You know, but mm -hmm. today we don't like talking about that for some reason. And um, I think it's important, right? You would want to warn somebody of <laughs> of something like that. So, yeah, with that with that Edwards sermon, man. Um, one Edwards was more, you know, how that sermon's presented. He got up and read a manuscript. You know, I mean, there there might have been some inflection, but he was not a fire and brimstone preacher. Um, now you can see Whitfield doing something like that, but not Edwards. Um, but people were holding on to the pew for fear of falling into hell. And I mean, that the reason why that's in our textbooks is because it's a master of, um, that's an example of a master of rhetoric. Edwards, and probably even better than him, is Spurgeon. Spurgeon was a master of rhetoric. And um, that that's something else. You know, they, they're, today the masters of rhetoric are usually the heretics, and uh, they use it to craft their their heresy to where in in these catchy little slogans that sound biblical that sound or it gets you twisted enough to where you can't really get yourself out of it like you know um god calls us you know if they you hear folks like um preston sprinkle jackie hill perry um they say stuff like when you get saved if you're a homosexual God calls you to be holy, not heterosexual. That kind of, you know, these rhetorical turns of phrase that are unbiblical, but it makes you step back and say, well, but it, it there's two things that are happening with that phrase, with that turn of phrase. One, you're assuming that uh, homosexuality is ontological. It's who you are. It's part of who you are. And two, you're pitting God's design against God's design. You're saying, because heterosexuality is God's design. That's literally how our bodies were designed according to Genesis 2. I mean, you know, listener, God gave you specific parts that are literally designed for the marriage bed. I mean, that, that's part of their design. That's you, They're not designed for homosexual relationships. It's... That's not a one flesh relationship. It's not, it's literally, that's upside down, according to Romans 1. It's contrary to God's design. And so pitting God's design against God's design, it, it it's just this homosexuality and just lust of the flesh in general has been treated as a special sin, as a, um, you know, I mean, we, we call murderers to no longer murder. They can't even hate in their hearts. We call them to repentance. We don't say, you know, when you when you get saved, the murderer is called to be holy, not to be loving, or is some turn of phrase, or the trans person, you know, even using that language, trans person. The trans person isn't called to be male or female. He's he's called to be holy. You know, using the that type of rhetoric. And that's that's the same thing that folks argue. Like literally, when God saves us, he calls us to full repentance, to repent of all sin. And they're saying, well, you don't have to repent of homosexuality. You just don't act on it. And that's just not what the Bible teaches. You have to be pure in heart in order to be a Christian, in order to go to heaven. Now, when you repent and believe in Christ, you're given a new heart. You're credited with the righteousness of Jesus. You're saved based on his works, not ultimately your own. But out of his work in you, you are expected to live a holy life from your heart. And if people run around calling themselves gay Christians or lustful Christian, there's even a website called ChristianPedophile.com where a guy refers to himself and he encourages others that we're Christians who just happen to be pedophiles too. And that's the consistent outworking of this argument. Well, I'm a Christian, but I'm also gay. Or I'm a Christian, I'm also, you know, a luster. Or, you know, there. When I was a kid, it was uh, there was this assumption that men would just always battle lust, that they would just, you know, and and so that was kind of the acceptable sin. I mean, they said it was sin, but the assumption was that men are going to lust, and 
this is this assumption is is well if you're gay you're and I there's no one who's gay. It's just a pathological sin pattern. No one is ontologically gay. Um, and so God can change a pathological sin pattern, regardless if it's for um, you know, heterosexual lust, same sex desires, you know, he can change any sin pattern. And uh, but you have to repent, you have to turn from that and fight it tooth and nail. And people that's something else. People aren't willing to fight. They've kind of got this Keswick mentality, let go and let God, uh, where they take no responsibility to put their dukes up and fight indwelling sin. And no no wonder they're battling indwelling sin constantly. Number one, they're you know, if you've talked to any gay Christian, all they talk about is their sexuality. That that's just all constantly. They're talking about their feelings all the time, they're talking about the mirror all the time, they're talking about their identity, blah, 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 blah. You know. Just quit talking about yourself. You're never going to overcome same-sex desires by talking about it all the time. You need to talk about Jesus. You need to talk about His righteousness, His holiness. That should be what dominates your thought life. And it, people, it's it's the exact opposite. It's turned on its head where speakers are encouraging people. You know, evangelical Christians are encouraging people to talk about Literally, their evil desires all the time. And yeah, no, wonder, I think, no wonder they can't overcome it. Yeah. I, I don't know. This might get me in a little bit of trouble, but uh, I think a lot of that has to do, too, with, like, some of the culture of, like, really pushing therapy. And specifically, I think, um, secular therapy. Um, I, I think Christian therapy is great. I think it's needed. Um, I've never partaken really in it, but in therapy, right? You're always expressing feelings and always like talking about things. But like you're saying, like, well, where's the part where you actually like <clears throat> repent of these things, where you actually confess these as sin and say, I don't want this and I want Jesus. And then you just start talking about Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's none of that. Like it's just overly communicating uh, your sin because they think yeah, that's like healing constantly. it. People thinking about, they think about themselves all the time. They're encouraged to think about themselves all the time. They literally, they have two identities. And, all, and even folks who say, well, it's not my identity. When they stand up and talk, they're, they'll, they won't say I'm a gay Christian. They'll say I'm a Christian who is same-sex attracted or who experiences same-sex attraction. Like, who talks like that? Nobody in the Bible talks about their sin that way. You don't see Paul saying, I experience the flesh. He says, with the flesh, I serve the law of sin in Romans 7. That's how Paul talks about his flesh. He doesn't experience it. See, if folks are trying to use rhetoric to disconnect themselves from their own evil desires and thoughts. And you can, you, if you're experiencing something, if it's happening to you, how are you going to repent of something you can't have any control over whatsoever? That's just not how the Bible presents sin. We, and we have to take responsibility for our evil desires so that we can have victory over them. So, li listener, if you're a Christian, you've got the Holy Spirit indwelling you, you are capable of repenting. You're capable of turning from, and God can literally change those desires to where you never have them again in this life. But you've got to fight those desires and you've got to build your life around worshiping Yahweh by the Spirit through the Son to the Father. You have to worship God and build your life on Him. You have to read the Word and believe it. Believe what it says, not your feelings. The Bible, there's no way you're going to get from the Bible that you are gay or that you are a luster or that you have to commit particular sin. Now, you're a sinner as a Christian. Paul says he's a sinner. He says he's still got his flesh that serves the law of sin. But and So you can't be perfect on, in this life, but you can live outwardly a holy life, and you can have pure desires. Now, the flesh is with us, so it produces things that are contrary to God. But the more that you starve it, the quieter it gets. And the more you feed it, the bigger it grows. And, uh, and so I think that, um, like Romans 1, they, 
you know, they turned worship upside down, then they turned their sexuality upside down, then they dove into all kinds of sin. It's kind of the progression of Romans 1. If you turn that on its head and you worship God, that's what you build your life on, it corrects worshiping God, corrects our wrong thinking, our evil desires, um, and it rightly orders our affections to where we're no longer living for ourselves. We're living for the Lord. And um, and I, I just it just seems like a lot of folks, they want to say, well, I prayed and God didn't take this away. So I'm just stuck with it the rest of my life. They don't want to fight. They don't want to reject those evil desires. They Instead, they want to justify them. They're tired of fighting and dwelling sin. And so groups like Revoice come along, Preston Sprinkle comes along, and they tell people what they want to hear. And it really is bad. It's really worse than I realized. I've got a, a fella who's asked me to look at a lot of stuff that Preston Sprinkle has um, has endorsed. And um, I'm going to write an article this next week that will come out. And it's just shocking the things that they have endorsed behind the scenes that people aren't aware of. Um, but it, it's they're handing they're literally handing out millstones to people. I mean, they're literally people are ensnared in sin, and instead of helping them get out of it, they're telling them that no, you can be godly and faithful in your sin. They're not telling them to repent, and. Um, it just ensnares people further. I'm sorry, man. I'm talking a lot. I don't. No, it's great. I mean, this is why we want you on, right? Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's really struck a nerve with a lot of the the side B Christianity kind of stuff, you know. Which, um, if, for those listening that don't know what that is, it's basically this idea that you can call yourself a gay Christian even if you're not practicing that sin which I don't think is right. We wouldn't do that with any sin. I saw some some brother on Twitter say um, homosexuality is like the only sin that we put an asterisk on. And it's like, it's so true because it's like, we would never call ourselves adulterous Christians or I don't know, anything you want, you know, murderous Christians. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think you kind of like nailed it on the head where you're talking like, this has really hit their identity and that's why they don't like it. Right. Because they don't want to let go of the sin. And I remember this wasn't the case probably, I don't know, 20 years ago, I went to a, a conference and one of the speakers there um, shared that he, he used to be gay and, and that was the language, right? Used to be. Mm -hmm. And that was his old life and he had gotten saved uh, he followed Christ and God actually brought him a wife and he got married. And yeah, and I, I think that is like somehow lost in a lot of circles today, especially the louder ones. Like they don't see that there is like the possibility that God could transform. Right. Like like you read the Bible and G I think you posted this on Twitter, if I remember, like Jesus casted out like those demons um, legion into a herd of pigs. And you don't think that he can change your desires like. He can definitely do that. That's what he's he's in the business of doing, right? Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of repenting of the sin and submitting mm -hmm. it to him. Yes. And starving that flesh, like those fleshly we, desires. We have to believe it. That's the thing. Like mm -hmm. we have to believe because if you're building your life around worshiping God, you are who he says you are and you are becoming who he is making you to be then you believe he is conforming you to the image of Christ, and Christ is not gay. Christ has no same-sex desires. And so that's what we have to believe, and that is the goal. But by these folks telling by people like Preston Sprinkle, um, Wesley Hill, Nate Collins, Revoice, by them telling people, no, you're gay, you're always going to be gay, um, they're... One, they're being unbiblical. Two, they're treating it like a special sin. Three, they're ensnaring people further because they're not going to repent of those evil desires. And what's amazing about those guys is they teach something called sublimation where that you can actually turn. So you they, they break same-sex attraction into two parts, and they say that the sexual stuff, you got to repent of that. But the non-sexual... Same-sex attraction, 
the desire for same-sex intimacy, the recognition of same-sex beauty, um, you can sanctify that. And so they literally tell people to act on their non-sexual same-sex desires. And um, so what what's so ironic about it is they don't believe you have the power in the Holy Spirit to repent or turn from same-sex attraction. But they do believe that you can turn your same-sex attraction to holiness. So explain that to me. Explain to me how someone can't turn from it, but they can turn it. Like that it seems so inconsistent, doesn't it? Like, um, and even the notion of, well, there's good things in things that were caused by the fall. And Preston Sprinkle is notorious for this. Um, he'll make statements. He even he has an article on Christianity Today on polyamory. So, um, you know, multiple marriage and uh, married to more than one person or having more than one person in a relationship. And he argues that it's the pursuit of good things like family, um, love, and that couldn't be further from the truth. Because when God designed love, sexual love, he put it between a husband and wife. And if you say, no, I, I desire love, like just I desire love, and so I'm seeking out same-sex relationships, or a married man saying, I desire love, my wife isn't loving me properly, I'm going to go pursue my mistress. It is not a good thing that he's pursuing, not in any shape or form. And these guys, they, they're, again, they're masters of rhetoric. They're heretics. They're masters of rhetoric, and they can turn a phrase. Um, but if you just look at the Bible, if you just look at God's Word and realize, well, when God designed love, He did not create this innate desire in man for any kind of definition of love. You know, the, the pedophile that seeks out a child is not seeking out some form of love. I think we'd all agree. Um, but they they use this language of like, they act like it's a superpower. <laughs> they really do. Like uh, Preston will say, <clears throat> Wesley Hill will say, basically that men don't know how to love one another in friendship and that these uh, same-sex Christians or gay Christians can teach the church how to properly love the same sex. And Preston Sprinkle, he even he talks about how there's an aspect of same-sex attraction where Jesus and John, their relationship, and David and Jonathan, their relationship. And I'm like, no, 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 that's blasphemy. There was no ounce of same-sex attraction or desires in those relationships. None. Zero. It's just biblical friendship. It's not this ungodly perversion that these guys are arguing. Um, but, uh, but man, it's just everywhere. It is, it's amazing how it has permeated everything. And I, you know, call me conspiracy theorist, but I think there's dark money arguing this stuff in my opinion. And by dark money, I mean that these guys are well-funded and that all their funds are not legit. Um, everybody who's arguing this stuff, it, it, it follow the money, follow the money. And, uh, because think about it, like, if uh, let's say that all same sex people who have same sex desires start pursuing opposite sex marriage, well, then Preston Sprinkle's ministry falls apart. Uh, Wesley Hill's ministry, Nate Collins, Revoice, it dies. Their ministry dies. All these people who are traveling everywhere and speaking at these conferences, the only thing that qualifies them to speak largely is that they have same sex desires. <laughs> Still, they have unrepentant sin in their heart. And so it qualifies them to speak on this subject, which that's the only sin, you know, like if we're preaching against racism, we don't bring in a racist who still has the desires. We don't bring in, you know, preaching against murder. We're having this anti-murder conference. Let's get all the, wait, wait, do you desire murder in your heart? Oh, if you do, well, you're qualified to come speak to this group. And I'm just like, it, it's insane. It's insane, man. It's and because it's it's this coddling of unrepentant sin, and so you got to have someone who's going to speak to these people and justify their sin. And 
I'm wanting to call folks to repentance. I'm wanting to, just like any other sin, they, they're treating it like it's this special sin that has these special qualifiers. And we need to turn the page, preach the text, call everyone to repentance, to fight the evil desires in their hearts because Jesus is worth the fight. He is why we fight. These people are tired of fighting indwelling sin, and so they're running to false teachers who will tell them you don't have to fight anymore. And, I mean, uh, you know, has God really said, right? I mean, that that's only the pure in heart shall see God. Yeah. Um, if you yeah. love me, keep my commandments. Be holy, for I am holy. Mm-hmm. You must deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow Jesus. I mean, all these things, these are things they don't want to do. I don't want to do it either sometimes, but I repent of that. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm tired of fighting and dwelling sin. Who, what Christian isn't? But I don't, I'm not going to go seek out a conference to tell me that I don't have to fight. Yeah. No, no, no. Jesus is worth the fight, man. That's why we fight. He's why we fight. You got, a, you got any questions or anything, brother? I'm, sorry. Well, I'm, I'm talking a lot. No, you're good. You're good. So my dad always tells me this. Um, he says, you know, we should be trying to get as close to holiness as we can, not trying to get as close to sin without sinning. And it mm-hmm. seems like that's what a lot of Christians do. You know, they try to like get to that line right before it becomes a sin. And then they're like, okay, I'm good right here. Why? Go the, go the other direction. Go to Jesus, you know? Yeah. And it yeah. reminded me of a story too. And so I heard a pastor say that there was an older brother in the church who faithful follower of Christ um, and really older, like maybe like in his eighties or something. But at this point he had a dream about a woman who was not his wife and he woke up and he was completely heartbroken and wept and was repentant and could not believe it at that age, he was still having dreams like this, you know? Mm -hmm. And I want a heart like that. And I don't think a lot of people do. I think they just think like, wow, this is who I am. Like, you know, I want a heart that breaks and weeps over the the sinful desires of my heart, you know, not one that's just fine with it. A lot of Christians would say, well, I was asleep when I had it, so it's not my fault. But who had the dream? (laughs) You know, like who had the dream? Who had the desire? Whose heart is, is, uh, still has flesh, you know? And if Paul's willing to repent, of his flesh and call it sin, then why would we disagree with the apostle Paul? And uh, we, we have a savior so we can run, run to Christ, you know, mm-hmm. and that's something else. Like why are you making excuses for your sin when you got a savior, you know, just go to him, confess it. Yeah. Amen. Um, I think a point that you hit in the book too, and I think you talked about it on a podcast. I can't remember which one. Um, but a lot of the, um, excuse that I hear a lot of times, and I, I've heard this for a while now is that, well, Jesus was tempted and without sin, we can be tempted and not sin. And this is kind of like a thing that the side B Christians use a lot. I, I think I probably used it back then, you know, I was pretty ignorant to this kind of stuff. Um, so, uh, can you explain how Jesus was tempted without sin? Sure. Sure. So, um, First off, Jesus was born due to God impregnating Mary, right? There's some supernatural, he's a supernatural birth. So he's not born a sinner like we are. He's not a child of wrath like we are. He's not sinful from conception like we are. Um, He is sinless. He has no evil desires, no evil inclinations. And so, first off, in order to have an evil desire, Jesus would have to will it. He would have to choose to have that desire and to desire evil, first off. So he's distinct from us in that way. And see, that's what's going on in the garden with Adam and Eve. Eve willed in her heart. So she didn't, nothing happened to her. She was not forced. She submitted you know, and Paul talks about this in the New Testament. I can't, it's in the pastoral epistles um, where he talks about how um, Eve was deceived, not Adam, that Adam knew what he was doing. 
Um, but Eve, the reason why the devil targeted her was because she was created to follow her husband's authority. And so she already had this submission in her and part of God's design of her. So the devil assumed, because he's crafty, he assumed that she would be easier to deceive than um, Adam was. And Adam, you know, he should have slayed the dragon. When you look in, um, when you look in uh, Genesis 3, uh, in the Hebrew, the U is plural. So the assumption is that Adam is standing there the entire time that the serpent is talking to his wife. And um, so she wills that evil desire for the tree, and Adam wills the desire for it. And um, immediately, once she agrees with the serpent, she wills it in her heart and then takes of the tree and eats with her mouth and then immediately becomes the tempter, becomes like her father, the devil. Submits. She is submitted to the devil as her father rather than God and gives of the fruit to her husband. And, um, you know, so she, um, I believe they fell in their hearts before they ate and I don't believe creation fell until Genesis 3 when God's handing out the judgments. You know, so because there's some who say, well, it doesn't make sense that creation fell um, as soon as she desired something evil in her heart or Adam did. Adam desired something evil in his heart. Um, but they fell when they desired sin and then... Um, Creation fell when God judged it as a result of their sin further in Genesis 3 there when he's handing out the judgments. So concerning Christ in the, in the, um, in the wilderness, the devil goes to Christ and he offers objectively good things. He doesn't, you know, he knows that Jesus is the rightful heir to David's eternal throne. Um, he knows who he is. That's why he goes to him. And the Bible literally says that Jesus fasted for 40 days and that he was hungry, which is a desire for food. So he desired food, but he did not desire it from the devil. But the devil goes to him, and it's, it's interesting. He just offers him objectively good things. He doesn't offer him inherently evil things. Like with King David, he offers him laziness. He offers him uh, lust, adultery, murder, lying, you know, all of those objectively evil things. There are no circumstances where those are justified. So he offers the old David with objectively evil things. He comes to the true David, the new David, and he offers him objectively good things. Well, why is that? Because David and Jesus are different. David's a sinner. Jesus is not. So he can only offer him good things if he's going to tempt Jesus. Now, the way the text reads in Matthew 4 and in Luke 4, in the wilderness, Jesus immediately responds with Scripture and rebukes the devil. So the devil offers him food, and he's quoting Scripture. Like he's quoting, these are objectively good things that in other circumstances... I mean, God's going to give Jesus these things either during his ministry or after the cross. So the devil offers him angel protection. You know, throw yourself down from this pinnacle, the temple, and angels will bear you up. So he's quoting scripture, and then Jesus quotes scripture right back. And then he offers him the kingdoms of the world, which he's the king of kings and lord of lords. It's just he's going to get these things after the cross. So he immediately rebukes the devil, and the devil flees. You know, I mean... So he offers Jesus only good things. And it's similar in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prays for the cup, if it be possible, for the cup of wrath to pass from him, but not his will, but God's will be done. Folks point to that and say, Jesus, you know, like Matthew Lee Anderson argues this, that Jesus desired to disobey his father in the Garden of Gethsemane. But that's not what the text says. The text says Jesus literally prayed, and Luke sums it up in Luke twenty two forty two, I believe, where he says, um, "He says, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me; not my will, yours be done." So he wants to do his Father's will, but he doesn't want to drink his Father's wrath. And here's the thing: if Jesus is holy, 
he shouldn't want to drink his father's wrath. Like that's literally something he should not want. He should not want to die. He should not have a death wish. He should not want to be beaten, be scourged. Um, he shouldn't want any of those things. He shouldn't want to become sin. I mean, should he, if he's holy, should he want any of those things? No. But he should want to do his father's will which is exactly what he prayed. So if you ever have difficult providence, look at Jesus and see how he dealt with difficult providence. Like I shouldn't want, you know, my mother died of Parkinson's. I shouldn't want her to die of Parkinson's. I shouldn't want her to have Parkinson's, but I should want God's will to be done. And I trust him. And so I can rejoice that she's in heaven, even though I still would love for her to be here with me. You know, I mean, we understand this with other things, but for some reason, people have latched on to Jesus's temptations to try to self-justify by saying, I'm like Jesus. No one's ever had their sin taken away by saying, I'm like Jesus. Actually, the whole point of the, <laughs> the Bible is you're not like Jesus. I mean, that, that's literally the whole point, that we're not like Jesus. We need to be. We've got to turn from ourselves and trust in him, and he will make us like him. But these guys want to look at his temptations and say, I'm like Jesus. And they want to, they want to do it so that they can justify their evil desires, their same-sex desires. So then, then their desire to sodomize someone, they're comparing that to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane praying that not to drink his father's wrath. It's just, it's incredible. And that people quote Hebrews, I think it's Hebrews 4.15, where Jesus was tempted in every way like us. But if you read the chapter of Hebrews 4, if you read the book of Hebrews, the whole point of the book of Hebrews is that Jesus is better than us. He's better than the Old Testament priests. He's better than the Old Testament prophets, the kings. He's better than the Old Testament sacrificial system. He's better than all that. And so when the Bible talks about him being our sympathetic priest, it's talking about him being truly human and truly tempted yet without sin. It's not talking about him having evil desires or him desiring evil things. Jesus doesn't have to desire evil things to be truly human because Adam was truly human before he sinned, before he desired evil. Our loved ones in heaven are truly human. They don't have any evil desires. You know, I mean, people, we just need to think instead of feeling. Your feelings need to be subservient to the Word of God. When you read the Word of God, you submit to whatever it says and believe it. And when your feelings are contrary to it, you repent of your feelings. You don't adjust Scripture to try to fit your feelings, which is, I think, a lot of what folks are doing, and that's why they're sidetracked. And I mean, it... I find it very freeing because instead of me living based on how I feel, which is up and down and all over the place, and I mean, can quite frankly, if you're on any medication, I'm I'm not, but if you're on any medication, your feelings can really go nuts. Um, you you read the word, submit to it, do what it says, believe it, and get up and live for the Lord. Does that answer? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Amen. Well, I, I think that's all I had for you today, um, but where can uh, everyone find you? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Jared H. Moore. That's where I'm most active. If you have any questions or, or if you're angry, or, you know, feel free to, uh, to get on there and just, just text me, tweet me, and uh, I'll do my best to answer. But uh, I'm, I believe in being direct, and folks, folks don't like that. Like for most of uh, church history, Everyone was just direct. They said what the Bible said. They didn't tiptoe around it and try to, you know. Um, and so it's not that I'm not concerned about people's feelings. It's just um, I believe in being direct. You know, you know how folks are like uh, racism is the worst sin, you know, and in in how they teach against racism. You know, they, they don't worry about the racist feelings. They don't. And what I'm saying is, no, yeah, racism's bad. All sin is bad. And if we're going to use the tone that we do about racism, 
biblically, why wouldn't we use the tone that the Bible does about sin? So um, my tone goes with how heinous the sin is. So retributive justice, an eye for an eye, which is what the Bible teaches is biblical justice. Right? That's why they use terms like mercy, where God has divine pity, and grace, which is unmerited favor. In other words, you deserve worse. You don't deserve the pity of God, and you don't deserve the grace of God. And so why is that? Because of our sin. So if God's ideal for human sexuality is one man, one woman, covenantly bound together for life, the further you get from that, the more heinous the sin is. So my preaching against those things, the further you get from that, the more my tone is going to be worse. Because sexual morality is awful. Homosexual morality is worse. Bestiality is worse. You, you know what I'm saying? Like the further mm -hmm. you get, because the more detrimental it is to you as an image bearer, and to society and to your family and friends. But to, and so um, I guess what I'm saying is like, you know, don't, don't tone police me because I'm just going to ignore you. And I may make fun of you because everybody wants to come hard against particular sins that are really bad in the culture. And I'm, I'm trying to follow exactly what the Bible says and to use tone biblically in relation to how heinous the sin is. Um, but anyways, yeah, find me on Twitter. You can uh, find my book on, if you want a paperback, you find it on freegracepress.com. If you want a, a Kindle, it's on Kindle, Amazon Kindle. And, um, you know, if you read it, I'd love to hear your comments, questions. Um, you know, but I, I hope it's beneficial. I just, man... There is freedom to be had, and people are missing out on it because they're running to the mirror instead of to Jesus and all these other guys that are this gay Christianity stuff, man. It sends everybody running to the mirror because you have to say, well, because they, they say that acting on it is sin, and so you have to run to the mirror and say, well, is this happening to me or did I act on it? Was there any bit of me that acted on it? You're constantly running to the mirror. but biblically all you have to do is run to jesus and confess your sin you know forgive us our debts i mean the the lord's prayer you know we're supposed to pray that constantly or at least that formula i mean it's never prayed again in the new testament that i'm aware of but that formula formulaic prayer of you know honoring god confessing sin um praying for our daily needs those types of of things but confession of sin is in there we're more sinful than we realize, brother, but God is more gracious than we realize. And and so I, I think that that's what's going to compel people mm -hmm. to live holy lives. It's not telling them, ah, you're not sinning, you know, and that doesn't take your sin away. Like telling someone they're not sinning doesn't take their sin away. But anyways, brother, that where am I at? I'm on Twitter. If you want to find <laughs> me. <laughs> Cool. I'll, I'll put the link down below for your Twitter, and then I'll also put it for uh, where you can get your book. Um, so you said freegracepress.com? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, man. Again, I really, really appreciate it. Uh, I really recommend the book for anyone listening to this um, to get into it. And uh, yeah, have a good rest of the day. And thank you, brother. <laughs>